Go to the live page and see if you can see it. Is, is this the real one? Yeah. So do I click live video here, or I don't do anything, right? I don't know where it shows up. I don't see it showing up. So I can zoom in on the slides a little bit if needed, but I don't know when to do the people and when to do the slides. Hey Siri, Paul Yeah, you need to see if she can see it. I don't know how to mute the sound.
any control, so. Do we have music? Good afternoon, this is Adrienne McBride. I'm the new Executive Director of the Fibrous Dysplasia Foundation and I'd like to welcome you to today's live stream, Treatment Guidelines, a Clinical Pathway to FDMAS Cure. I am so privileged to be in the office today of Dr. Mike Collins. He's here with Allison, Dr. Allison Voice, and um, we're bringing you this live stream because we at the FDF feel it's so important to have educational programming. Um, I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Um, this is Dr. Michael Collins. We're going to turn the camera around here. Dr. Collins is the Senior Investigator of the Skeletal Disorders and Mineral Homeostasis Section. Did I say that right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> With the NIH, NIDCR. Um, Dr. Collins is a non-voting member of the um, Fibrous Dysplasia Foundation Director since its incorporation. He's the first recipient of the Constellation Award from the Foundation in recognition of all the contributions he's made to the care and well-being of people with FD and MAS. Thank you for being here. Um, we're also here with Dr. Allison Boyce. Allison is a pediatric endocrinologist with the NIH and she's the principal investigator for the NIDCR's Natural History Study of FD MAS. That's a very important study. Um, she's our Medical Advisory Council Chair, and she too received the Constellation Award in um, 2017 because of her generous service to the community. We thank you for that. We're here with two of the leading experts on this disease, and we're lucky to work with them. But before I hand the mic over to Dr. Collins and Dr. Boyce, I have a few housekeeping items to cover with this presentation. Today's um, live streaming will be available, the slides will be available after the presentation. And um, we'd love to hear from you during the presentation. So if you have a question for our speakers, please put them in the comment section, or you can email us at info at fibrousdysplasia.org. We'll be answering questions at the end of the presentation. And don't worry if we don't get to your question, we'll use it for a future educational um, event. Um, I would also, um, like you to know that you can share um, this presentation. You can use the social sharing icons at the top of your player um, to post this live stream directly on Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn. So without much any further ado, I'd like to kick things off by welcoming Dr. Collins and Dr. Boyce. Thank you, Adrian, for that introduction. Uh, uh, Dr. Boyce and I are, are really glad to be here. Um, this is the reason that we do the work we do, is to help patients with fibrous dysplasia and chemo breast syndrome. Uh, and so this is a great opportunity for us to introduce these new practice guidelines that were put together and published recently, and we'll go into how that all came about. But um, again, thanks, and we will proceed. Uh, this is what the guidelines look like. Um, there's a URL down here that we'll share with you and will be on the website. And this is open access, so anyone can have access to these, patients can have access to these, patients, physicians can have access to these. And so that's one of the really nice features of this, we think, is that these guidelines are available to everybody for free. Um, we'll proceed with a, a set of questions. I should say so too. Uh, just echo what, what Adrian said, is that um, we really are depending on and welcoming questions from you guys. Um, uh, that's Again, that's why we're here. Uh, any questions that you have, don't hesitate. You can stream them to us live and we'll address them at the time. 
or you can save them to the end. Uh, either way you want to do it. We have plenty of time, so we welcome your questions. So first we'll go to why did researchers create these guidelines? And uh, Allison, you want to pick sure. that up? So um, the purpose of these guidelines is to try to improve the type of clinical care that patients are receiving. So FDMAS is a really complex disease, and it has a number of really unique challenges for clinicians who are trying to care for patients. Um, in particular, you know, FDMAS can present many different ways. So really no two patients are alike. Two patients can have very different problems. And when you have a rare disease where a doctor may only see two or three patients over the course of their career, when those patients all appear so different, it can be difficult for that clinician to feel like they've gained some familiarity in, in how to treat patients. Um, another challenge is that there are so many different types of specialties that are involved in treating patients with FDMAS. Some patients, if they have primarily bone problems, may see mostly orthopedic surgeons. Other patients may mainly see endocrinologists or uh, primary care physicians. So it can be difficult to develop, to approach a disease when we have clinicians who are coming from very different perspectives. Um, and what this has led to is really big discrepancies in the quality of the care that patients are receiving. So did you want to talk a bit about how they're created? Yeah, so, yeah, and I just wanted to echo too, I mean, <coughs> What, what, what Dr. Boyce just said, uh, I know that a lot of times it, it's frustrating for patients when they go to see the doctor and the doctor says, oh, I've never seen a patient with this. And actually, you should be glad that the, <laughs> the doctor is willing to say that it's the ones who don't admit that that you should uh, run from. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, so we recognized, and I, when I say we, maybe this is a good time to talk about, this is really a, a, an international group that put this together. Uh, over a long period of time, we'll go into some how, how it was done, which I think is important. But we, the, the group of investigators, recognized this fact that, you know, the treatment recommendations were, were all over the map, that, that people were doing very different things, uh, some good, some not, and there was really a tremendous need for some sort of overarching guidelines uh, for care, and, and so that's why we did this. So what we wanted to create was a consensus statement um, and it was created by 51 doctors and stakeholders uh, around the, the globe, really, that, that care and see for patients with viruses. So doctors that take care of patients, patients, uh, patient group representatives, uh, it was really quite a mixed group, but all the people who are important to understanding how this disease is cared for. And so Within that, there was a core guideline development group uh, formed at the first FDMAS International Consortium meeting that took place in Oxford in 2015. And this was the core of people who put this together and put this out to others, and then the core that this came back to to facilitate the publication. Uh, a draft of this document was circulated to the wider group, the 51. Comments were received and items with greater than 70% consensus were included in the guidelines. Um, there's a name for this process. It's a recognized, standardized, established process. It's called a modified Delphi approach, where you, this is winnow down, winnow down the most important and agreed upon recommendations. Patient representatives independently developed a separate patient checklist, which we'll discuss at the end as well, to help patients and doctors to use these guidelines. Anything else for that? No, I think that sums it up. So what changes do these guidelines represent in care for patients with FDMAS? So one important issue that they tackle is they really try to definitively define what type of terms we're talking about. There's been a lot of confusion um, in this disease about what constitutes a patient with just FD, what constitutes a patient with MAS. So we try to really clearly define what is considered MAS or McCune-Albright syndrome. So in this document, we've defined McCune-Albright syndrome as the combination of fibrous dysplasia and one or more extraskeletal features, or two or more extraskeletal features. And I've included a list of the extraskeletal features uh, below, and you can also see this if you uh, download either the guidelines or these slides. But I'll read them out. So the extraskeletal features, there are six that are included in the definition. One is a cafe au lait skin macule that has characteristic features, so that includes jagged borders or relationship respecting the midline of the body. Two is either recurrent ovarian cysts in girls and women or testicular lesions in men or boys. And this 
may can be either associated with precocious puberty or not. What's important is either having the cysts or having the lesions. The third feature is thyroid lesions with or without hyperthyroidism. The fourth is growth hormone excess. The fifth is neonatal hypercortisolism. It's also called Cushing syndrome. And the sixth is intramuscular myxomas, which in the past has been referred to as Mazabrod syndrome. Okay. So one of the questions then that arises from this are what changes do these guidelines represent in the care uh, from previously published work in this area? And so I think it's important to know that this is uh, because of what Dr. Boyce said earlier that you know no two patients are alike. It really is impossible to say that this is how patients should be treated, because a lot of that may not apply to a particular patient. So <clears throat> what these do is they outline the full diagnostic workup that most patients need. They inform the doctors in making the management decisions, and the guidelines, but the guidelines do not dictate the care for every patient. This is a very individualized approach. They do not dictate the specific surgical approach. This is also, again, very individualized and they do not replace the need for doctors to think about each patient individually. And I don't think these points can really be overemphasized enough uh, in regard to FDMAS. It's a complex disease and every patient is different. But what these guidelines do do is give an overarching context, an overarching roadmap of how to approach the patient. And if you use these guidelines to approach the patient and to do this diagnostic evaluation, that should then guide the individual care for that patient. Um, so we wanted to include just a couple examples of the type of flow charts that are included in the, in the guidelines. So each section um, related to a different feature of FDMAS has its own corresponding flow chart, which is really an attempt to provide the clinician with some really direct actionable items to help them make decisions. And there's a number, I think six or seven at least, of these flow charts, and we, we don't have really the time or, or um, uh, the need to go through every one of them individually. But just to show an example, this is what the flow chart looks like for management of pain and fibrous dysplasia. And it you know, allows the clinician to have a nice starting place. So you, know, you have a patient with pain. Is the pain related to fibrous dysplasia? Uh, does the patient have a, see, at risk for a fracture or a severe deformity? You know, and, and then if the, pa if the doctor feels that that is the case, then it gives them another pathway to go down. If that's not the case, it gives them you know, a, a decision tree um, that's separate. Um, included in pain management and fibrous dysplasia, we know that bisphosphonates are an important tool. Um, there's a lot of confusion in the community of physicians about what dose of bisphosphonates to give, how often to give the bisphosphonates. We did include very specific information about that in the guidelines that may be helpful. I'm going to go ahead and just do this one too. Here's an example of another flow chart. Um, this is one related to an endocrine problem, precocious puberty management in girls. And you can see that it gives the doctors really specific scenarios. So if the bone age is advanced more than two years, um, and that the patient is having frequent bleeding and psychological distress, then it recommends starting treatment and it gives them very specific medications to start with and doses to start with. Um, if that's not the case, it recommends how often to monitor the patient and what type of signs to look out for. Um, and then here is a, just a couple screenshots from the uh, patient checklist. So this was a toolkit that was developed by the patient groups as part of the consortium. And the goal of this document is to have the patients have something that can, can accompany the guidelines and really put them in context. So it's a very nice tool you can get online that has six suggested questions um, or discussion points to bring to your doctor along with the guidelines. Um, and it has uh, questions you can ask the doctor. It has places where you can check, you know, yes, I need this test, no, I don't need this test, and why. So I, I think this is really helpful to kind of make the guidelines more usable and less overwhelming. So uh, how can you guys use this? How can you use it? How can your physicians use it? And how can you use it together, really? So what we recommend to you, the patients, um, is to recommend these guidelines to your doctors. And you can, in fact, consider bringing a physical copy of the paper with you, uh, or you can send it to your doctor electronically, or you can point him or her to the URL. 
um, and I think this is really quite useful. This really is certainly one of the more challenging medical conditions to treat. And, and I know, looking back to when I first started seeing patients with FDMAS, it really can be quite overwhelming. And this really can, can do a lot to make it much clearer and, and guide you in what to do. Uh, physicians in the FDMAS community, we, can, we encourage to share these um, guidelines with their colleagues and with the consulting physicians as well. And of course, we encourage you to share these on social media and get the word out in whatever way you can, including this uh, seminar we're doing here. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, and so uh, thanks very much. We're happy to answer questions. So we do have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, the first one asks for info on Mazabron syndrome. <laughs> Do you have yeah. anything to share? Yeah, so Mazabrod syndrome has been used to refer to the combination of fibrous dysplasia and intramuscular myxoma. Um, so it's a bit, and it's an example of what's been a little confusing in the terminology of Nicky Albright syndrome. So, you know, there are a number of different uh, extraskeletal or non-skeletal problems that can arise in a patient with fibrous dysplasia. We know that we see the capillary spots, we see the endocrinopathies. So really, intramuscular myxomas represent just another type of problem that can happen outside the skeleton in a patient with FD. Um, so when you think about it from a scientific standpoint, it really is another feature of McKean Albright syndrome. But for historical reasons, the first time someone in the medical literature found a myxoma in a patient with FD, they named it after themselves. <laughs> so, so, you but know. In I, fact, he wasn't even the first guy to find this. He, he wasn't actually. He, <laughs> Mazabrad was the second one to report this association. So, you know, it's a little tricky. I try not to use that terminology myself because I think it can add to the confusion, but I think it is important for us to be aware yes. that for many, many years it's been called Mazabrad syndrome, yep. and many patients identify as having Mazabrad syndrome, and I think that's completely fine. That's a valid way to feel. Um, but. We, we should definitely understand that this is something that fits under the umbrella of FDMAS and it's not really a separate condition. I, I would say, maybe then, and maybe I don't know if this was part of the question or not, mm -hmm. is that these intramuscular myxomas are, are fairly common mm -hmm. within fibrous dysplasia. Uh, the vast majority of them are discovered incidentally. That is, in other words, you're doing a scan, an MRI often, and you see within the muscle this thing, uh, and it's a myxoma. And a myxoma is just another benign uh, process. In most patients, this is discovered incidentally, as I said. It sits there, it doesn't do anything, you don't have to worry about it. It did happen a, a long time ago. There was somehow the uh, idea, the notion got raised in the medical literature that perhaps uh, these, that patients who had these intramuscular myxomas were more likely to have a worse course. And that certainly hasn't been our observation at all. Yeah, in fact, there were some that said that it seemed to be more likely to have bone cancer if you had a myxoma, and it's just not been it, It's not the case. So, so yeah. I think that also added to this undue fear of these myxomas. Now, that said, some of these myxomas can get quite large and they can cause symptoms. Mm -hmm. And if they get large and if they're causing symptoms, they should probably be resected. <coughs> usually, because they're in muscles, they're relatively superficial and it's usually a relatively simple operation and they can be resected and usually that's the end of the story. Sometimes, especially if they're not completely resected, they can recur. Um, but as Dr. Boyce pointed out, it's just another part of the McCune Albright syndrome. It's not something to be scared of. It's one of actually the, 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 the less worrisome features of, of McCune Albright syndrome. Okay, so next question. Does radiation treatments help or make it worse? Well, that's a pretty easy one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, there was a period of time within medicine not so long after the discover of radiation therapy that everything was radiated. Acne was radiated, tonsils were radiated, you could go get your feet measured by, by x-rays in, in, in the store. Uh, and then after 
time, and, and, and so fibrous dysplasia, so why don't we radiate? So they radiated it, and sure enough, as we have learned that radiation, you know, pr promotes malignant transformation, there was an uptick in the prevalence of transformation of fibrous dysplasia, which is a deny, benign process to malignant, uh, a malignant process, and so it was pretty quickly recognized that that was a bad thing and that it shouldn't be done. You, you want to talk some about the necessity for radiation in the diagnosis, X-rays, yeah. CTs, things so I like think that? We should definitely be clear that we're, you know, there are two, we're talking about two different types of radiation. So there's therapeutic radiation, which is given, for example, for cancer as an attempt to try to kill the cancer cells. So those are very high doses of radiation. Um, and then there is diagnostic radiation, which is the type of radiation you receive from tests like bone scans, X-rays, um, and other types of imaging. So patients with fibrous dysplasia certainly do need diagnostic tests that include radiation. Uh, bone scan is something that's important as part of the diagnosis. Periodic x-rays and CTs might be required to monitor lesions. In general, the amount of radiation you get from tests like that is nowhere near the type of radiation that's associated with getting a, a treatment for cancer. And we really don't have any reason to suspect that the amount of radiation you get just over the course of your clinical care is going to increase your cancer risk. Yeah. Uh, one thing we should mention too is that one of the treatments for pituitary problems that cause growth hormone excess can be pituitary radiation and that's something we usually stay away from in patients with fibrous dysplasia because they have fibrous dysplasia in the skull. That's really the only kind of specific recommendation about radiation yeah. that we have. I guess there's a couple of other things. So one mm -hmm. is the thyroid. Sometimes thyroid disease is treated with radioactive iodine. It's one of the treatments. It's not our first choice in, in mm -hmm. uh, McEwen Albright syndrome when there's thyroid disease. For us, it's sort of one of our last choices. If you need something done to the thyroid definitively, we much more are much more fond of, of surgical resection rather than radioactive rather than ablation of the thyroid with radiation. Obviously, and the other thing too, what Dr. Boyce was talking about, you know, one of the ways that, that radiation, diagnostic radiation is often put in context is that uh, most of, and I think maybe all of the typical uh, tests that are done for patients with fibrous dysplasia that involve radiation generally are, are less than the amount of radiation that someone encounters with a transcontinental flight. So when you go up and fly in an airplane, you're exposed to higher levels of radiation. And, you know, it's it's a little bit. I mean, if you flew every day for, you know, maybe pilots probably have higher uh, exposure to radiation. But just to give you the context. That said, it's always a good idea to limit the amount of tests that you get that involve radiation. Um, and so for that reason, I think it's really important that patients and parents, when you get any test done that involves radiation, an x-ray, a CT, or something like that, I think it's a really good idea to get a copy of that and save a copy of that so that when you go from your primary care physician or your endocrinologist to your orthopedic surgeon or vice versa, you have that x-ray, that study on a disc and they don't have to repeat it. And in that way you can limit your radiation. I think it's a good idea to collect and save all of your records mm -hmm. and keep them with you. And there is information in the guidelines about um, mm -hmm. how frequently to get some of these imaging tests that have radiation. So we have a few more other questions. Um, my son has, I'm going to say this incorrectly, achondroplasia, mm -hmm. skeletal dysplasia, and fibrous dysplasia in his arm. Are there any others with both or have two types of dysplasia? No, I'm not aware of anyone that we've um, seen that has both fibrous dysplasia and achondroplasia. No, it, it is certainly possible just because you have FDMAS doesn't mean that you can't have other genetic uh, disorders. But it's, um, as far as we know, there's no known association that having FDMAS makes you more likely to get any other genetic disorders. Yeah, I would say in regard to that too, I mean, it really is, you know, Recunal break syndrome fibrous dysplasia is very rare. Uh, the combination of two rare syndromes, eventually it's going to happen on the planet. But I would also say too that, that nowadays, um, for all of these uh, 
or not all, most of these syndromes, the genetic cause of them is known, and so genetic testing can be done, for example, on the disease that's considered fibrous dysplasia, and or on the, the, the DNA that's uh, presumed to be causing the, uh, the, the other skeletal dysplasia. So I would recommend for that person that in fact that the genetic testing be done on these lesions to give nearly 100% confidence that in fact there does exist these two rare syndromes in one limb. So here's an interesting question. Is there a potential cure editing out the gen genetic mutation like CRISPR? Yeah, so there's certainly been a lot of exciting developments in uh, techniques that can actually change or fix a mutated gene in someone's DNA. Um, if that if those type of techniques became widely available, they could have huge implications for a lot of different genetic disorders, including FBMAS. Um, at this point, CRISPR, um, and CRISPR being one of the, the main most exciting current ones, um, right now CRISPR certainly seems to be very useful in the lab and in I think in certain animal models mm -hmm. for actually fixing mutations and uh, potentially curing diseases. So it, it is really exciting. Um, the next step will be taking that technique out of the lab and into the clinic and actually applying this to patients, um, which I think is certainly something that we'll start to see in the future. Anytime you pilot a new type of technique or, or try something very different in a patient, there's always going to be risks associated with it. Um, so it's something that has to be done very carefully as part of a research study. With CRISPR in particular, I think probably the first application of this new technique is going to be in diseases that are known to have very bad outcomes. So if you have a disease that you know is going to be fatal in a baby, for example, you might be willing to accept a lot of risk with a new technique um, because you know that without that technique, the outcome is going to be really bad. FDMAS, although there certainly is a huge need for better treatments in FDMAS, at this point it's not a disorder that tends to shorten your lifespan, so I think the amount of risk we would tolerate with one of those new techniques would be you know, very high, and, and we, FDMAS would not be one of the first disorders we would try a gene editing therapy on. But, you know, once those therapies are tried in these more severe disorders, and a lot of the, you know, the kinks are worked out and the safety issues are identified, you know, I do think there's potential for using this, these type of techniques in FDMAS. That's probably going to take quite a long time, though. Did you have anything you want to add to that? No, no, I mean, it, it's one of the difficulties with FDMAS is one of the biggest problems is the bone. And it's, and, and so you need to get these editing, these genetic editing techniques into bone cells. And it, for a lot of reasons, bone cells are, are seem to be more difficult to deal with than other cells. So again, I, I agree 100% that uh, theoretically it's possible. One day it may come to pass. Uh, the, the kinks will be worked out on other diseases and they can then, then be adapted to FDMAS. Um. Do we have time for one more question? Sure. Okay. Because there's a lot of questions coming in, okay. and there's some that have been sent by info. It says here, can an FD lesion in the rib be removed? No, well, that, that's a really interesting question. So, you know, the, the problem is it, it depends on how many of the ribs are involved. Um, you know, the, like every other part of MAS, you can have very anywhere from having just one rib involved to all the ribs involved. We have seen patients, if they have a single rib involved, and it's causing a lot of pain, and it's causing a lot of fractures, um, sometimes those patients can benefit from just removing that rib because uh, you know you have multiple other ribs around it. Um, if you have extensive rib involvement, you know, surgery may not be a great option. Um, I've heard from the patient community, I've heard that the patient community was involved with this publication. How? Mm -hmm. So the patients are actually involved, uh, the patient community was a really important part of this publication. So the, you know, the need to develop these guidelines really became apparent at our first international consortium meeting in Oxford in 2015. Um, that was a meeting that was held jointly with clinicians, researchers, and patients. Um, the, the patient group involved there was the FDSS UK, and we also had representatives from the Fibrous Dysplasia Foundation who joined us at the meeting. Um, 
Yes, yeah, so we see here Anne Underhill was from the FDSSUK. Mm -hmm. uh, Deanna Portero was mm -hmm. from the Fibrous Displeasure Foundation. Lisa Harrell mm -hmm. was from the Fibrous Displeasure Foundation. So they were included <coughs> really in that core um, guideline group that Dr. Collins discussed that helped draft the document. We received comments from them as part of the wider group. And then I think one of their really big contributions was that they were really the ones that came up with the patient toolkit. Um, which, you know, is the, it is the tool that patients can bring to the doctors to help put the guidelines in context. So, yeah, and it really it, it was massively important to have the patient involvement. Yep. Now here's another question. Is hormone replacement safe with FDMAS with a history of endometrius and osteoporosis? Well, so it, it's really difficult to answer specific questions uh, about a patient uh, without having all the background information, we should probably have a little disclaimer that yes. you know th this isn't uh, uh, specific recommendations for specific patients for their care. Uh, so, generally speaking, it is possible to treat uh, patients with fibrous dysplasia between all syndrome with either oral contraceptive pills or hormone replacement therapy. That said, depending on the context there might be better approaches. So having FDMAS is not what we would call an absolute contraindication to any of these therapies. Uh, but it does depend on the context. So there are other treatments for osteoporosis that may be better for um, the, the hormone replacement therapy. Um, and depending what the need is and depending on the specific circumstances. So it is a complex. And I can't remember, is that addressed in any specifically detailed way uh, here? So. Probably not. But it is certainly something that, you know, uh, you could talk with your doctor about, and, and we would be glad to talk to him or her if they wanted to reach out to us if they felt a need for that. Here's a question. What would you recommend for FD of the skull? I have a headache that, or I have a headache that's so bad that the pain is unbearable. Headaches can be a big problem in patients who have FD in the skull. And again, it kind of gets back to knowing a little bit more about the specifics because there's a number of different things that can cause headaches in patients with FD. The very uncommon ones, but things you wouldn't want to miss, um, is occasionally um, like a, a, a new headache, and especially a very, very severe headache, can sometimes signal that there might be something developing in the FD lesion, like a bone cyst. So I would say if you have a, a brand new headache that's incredibly severe, um, sometimes that needs to be imaged with an MRI to, to make sure that there's no bone cyst developing. What's far more common is to have more classic type of headaches, um, you know, migraine headaches, chronic headaches. You know, we don't quite understand why patients with FD seem to be so prone to them. There may be a relationship with the bone lesion there. You know, we, no one really, there's a lot we don't understand about headaches and migraines in general. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, we use bisphosphonates frequently to treat bone pain associated with fibrous dysplasia. Unfortunately, they probably don't seem to work quite as well for skull pain associated with fibrous dysplasia, although it's something that may be worth a try. Um, in our patients who don't respond to bisphosphonates who have chronic headaches, I generally do recommend going to a headache specialist because there are a number of different medications and approaches for chronic headache that uh, neurologists are familiar with. And there's really nothing contraindicated in patients with fibrous dysplasia. So there's no specific headache medications that are given to the general population that we would recommend against for a patient. And they should bring the toolkit when they go. Yeah, yeah although, again, because there's not a lot of specific mm -hmm. headache uh, treatments targeted at fibrous dysplasia, it usually ends up using the, the same type of treatments that the general population uses. Yeah, it is a challenge in multimodal care, you know, with medicines and non-medical care. Mm -hmm. We have had patients who've had headaches who've gone as far, you know, not with our recommendation, but to have big surgeries to remove the fibrous dysplasia and then still had headaches afterwards. So yeah. the one thing I'd say, probably don't get, uh, don't think that removing a section of the fibrous dysplasia from the skull is going to cure the headaches. Right, right. Yeah. I had FD in my femoral neck with lesions, proximal and mid femoral diaphysis, whatever that means. <laughs> I, need a, a, I need a replacement and I've had a fracture of the hip 
I believe I also have FD in my spine. A past MRI showed hemangiomas, I know that word, <laughs> with um, within the T4, T8, and L1 vertebrae. I'm looking for a surgeon that has experience and have performed surgery on an FD patient before. So where's a good place to get a surgeon? Yeah, so I know that that's been a big effort on the part of the FDF is to come up with a clinician referral database. That's probably the first place I would start. But it can be really challenging to find patients experience, uh, surgeons who are experienced with FD. Yeah, it is difficult. It, and there's uh, some good surgeons on that list. Um, I would say generally speaking, if you had no guidance, orthopedic oncologists uh, for adult patients are generally uh, better doctors because they're used to working with complex bone diseases uh, and probably uh, being seen at a, at a tertiary referral center like at a university or someplace like that, you have a better chance of getting someone who has taken care of patients with complex bone diseases like this. Um, again, but the first place I would look would be on the FD uh, website for the re patient referral list. Um, it says here, I have FD in femur and femoral neck. Is a rod going to be fine for support or is hip replacement better? I'm 47. Worried that there's not enough healthy bone for hip replacement. Thanks. So, um, again, I, I, it's impossible in this case to give specific mm -hmm. recommendations. Uh, hip replacements have been done in patients with fibrous dysplasia, and again, depending on the specifics of the circumstance, they can work. We've also seen hip replacements done in fibrous dysplasia that didn't turn out well. So, impossible to make specific recommendations. Uh, every ortho, well, <laughs> almost every orthopedic surgeon does hip replacements, but I would ask that orthopedic surgeon, have you ever done a hip replacement in a patient with fibrous dysplasia or a disease like that? And, and if they say no, um, I would get a second opinion. Yeah, it can be hard to get the hardware to incorporate into the abnormal FD bone. So how big the FD lesion is and what part they're talking about replacing really mm -hmm. would affect the answer. Right, if the whole femur is involved, there's a better chance it's not going to work. If it's just a limited part of the femur and the rest of the bone and the hip and everything is good, it might work out okay. This is an interesting one. Is there any reason to not get mammograms every year because of all the past radiation from x-rays, nuclear scans, MRI, DEXA scans, etc.? Does it have radiation? Yeah, a mammogram has radiation and, and you know, again, it's impossible to make specific recommendations. So if if someone has had a boatload of radiation, which most patients with fibrous dysplasia should not have had that much, you could argue, well, maybe they're at increased risk for breast cancer because they've already had more radiation and they should be screened even and more we, closely. We may want to speak to the fact that we have seen a slight yeah. increase in risk of breast cancer in uh, women with FD, with MAS, uh, particularly those who have FD involving their rib region and uh, patients who have a, had a history of precocious puberty. It, uh, that was uh, actually one of the projects that came out of the FD International Consortium. You know, we teamed together with a group in the Netherlands that had a very large cohort of patients. Uh, we found that the increased risk of breast cancer seems to be pretty small, and fortunately it doesn't seem to be a risk for a very aggressive type of breast cancer. All of the women in both of our cohorts who had breast cancer it was caught very early. No one had metastatic disease. No one had any fatalities. Uh, but we do rec consider this with a moderate risk condition for breast cancer, and um, we recommended uh, screening mammograms, I think, at 50. Yeah. It's in the guidelines. Yeah. yeah. And again, we can't make specific recommendations, but my general recommendation is that uh, she should probably get the mammograms. Mm -hmm. okay. My wife has multiple FD sites and seems to experience an increase in pain in those areas during a particular stage of her menstrual cycle. Is this something that you would expect to be linked to the menstrual cycle, or is it a, a, a very regular coincidence? No, it, yeah, that is something that we hear from some patients. Um, so I think it's certainly possible. We don't have the sense that hormones, for example, make the FD much worse. You know, as Dr. Collins mentioned, using oral contraceptive pills is an option. It's, it doesn't, it's not gonna make your FD take off. 
but we do think sometimes the different surges in hormone levels might affect a bit how, how it feels, but it's not consistent for every patient. There are many patients who don't notice any change with menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. Donnie asks, I was just informed that biphosphonates can affect my dental treatment. Mm. Is that true? Yeah, no, excellent question. So uh, bisphosphonates are a type of medication that are most commonly used for patients with osteoporosis. For example, you know, postmenopausal women who have low bone density. Um, and they, um, so there's a lot, of, most of our safety data is related to that population, although they have been used for quite a long time in patients with FD. So a very rare side effect of bisphosphonates is something called osteonecrosis of the jaw. And this happens when, for some reason that we don't quite understand, the blood flow to the jaw is disrupted. Um, and this can lead to part of the bone in the jaw kind of getting necrotic and dying off. It, in the general population, it's been pretty well you know, delineated that the patients who are at the highest risk for osteonecrosis of the jaw are patients who've gotten lots and lots of intravenous bisphosphonates at high doses. Patients who have had um, a history of dental problems, and in particular, patients who undergo a dental procedure, such as a tooth being extracted or a root canal, you know, an invasive procedure, and then what can happen is that they don't fully heal from that procedure and it turns into osteonecrosis of the jaw. We have seen osteonecrosis of the jaw in patients with FDMAS, actually in our cohort, and we published that we've seen at least four or five cases. In every patient with FD, they had the same exact risk factors as you'd see in a general population. They all got years and years of very high dose um, bisphosphonates, and they all, I think all but one, had had invasive dental procedures beforehand. So what I think this shows us is that we do need to be careful with bisphosphonates, but fortunately we, we have the tools to identify the patients who are at the highest risk beforehand. So our approach to this is before we start bisphosphonates, we do recommend that patients are seen by a dentist to make sure they don't need an invasive dental procedure because if they do, for example, need a root canal or a tooth extraction, that's something you'd want to do before you started the bisphosphonates. Uh, we recommend that when patients are on bisphosphonates, they really maintain excellent dental hygiene. Um, they go to their dentist regularly. If they see a pro develop a problem like a cavity, if you take care of that early, you can prevent the need for that going into an invasive dental procedure. And then the last piece, which is also very, very important, is we try to get away with the lowest dose of bisphosphonates that we need to control the pain. And we only tend to repeat the bisphosphonates and give a, an additional dose once the, the pain seems to come back. So that way, rather than putting patients on a set schedule of you know, every six months you get this dose, we try to see um, what, how little we can get away with. And there are recommendations about that in the guidelines as well. Oh, here's one. Who should act as a care quarterback and endo, a surgeon? <laughs> I think you should act as the quarterback is any knowledgeable doctor who's invested in your care and cares about you enough to take on that role. <laughs> so find somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Boyce and I are both endocrinologists, so of course we think that endocrinologists <laughs> are the best. But I mean, no, seriously, it, it's someone who's knowledgeable and cares and is willing to take care of you. So, I, but it, it's a really good point. I do think there needs to be a quarterback because care, um, especially in this country, can be quite fragmented. You know, you're seeing this person, this doctor, and this doctor, and they're not talking to each other. They're doing the same tests over. You're getting more radiation than you need. So you do need, it, and you as the patient need to facilitate and, and I would say sometimes demand communication between your providers. Um, this is an important question. It's been in the news a lot. Um, what do you recommend for, uh, for pain? Um, can you speak to opioid use? So, I mean, all of the things, or most of the things that apply to the problems related to opioid use apply to the problems with opioid use in fibrous dysplasia and keen albright syndrome. And in FEMAS, like in other disorders, there was a, a, a period of time when opiates were relatively widely used because that's what was being used, widely used for pain. And I think almost invariably, uh, it, in our patients anyway, it has led to big problems. Um, and I think they, they should be avoided. Clear 
time for them place for them might be in the immediate post-operative period when there's acute pain and that should be treated with opiates. I think their chronic use is almost always a bad idea. There are other options, some of which may be better. Uh, and the evidence is emerging that, that opioids used chronically really aren't good pain medicines for, for chronic pain. Uh, anything else? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it, it, just for chronic pain in general, we have to think of FD as a chronic pain condition with the important exception of you know, fractures or surgeries, which can lead to an acute uptick. In yeah. Pain. You know, one of, actually one of the interesting things that has emerged, again, out of, out of a collaboration uh, as part of this consortium, and this is what uh, Dr. Boyce and Dr. Um, Javed have worked on, it, it's, 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 it seems to be the case that there's at least two types of pain in thymus dysplasia. One is the, an intrinsic bone pain, which generally seems to respond quite well to bisphosphonates. And then there's a type of pain that's called generally called neuropathic pain that uh, would be better treated with other types of medications for neuropathic pain. It's, it's an evolving picture, but I think that uh, it provides, at least for now, a good context of, to try to how to think about these types of pain syndromes. So that means there's a lot of space for study and pain. Yeah. Absolutely. We have no, it's a real black box. Mm -hmm. Bone pain in general is a black box, mm -hmm. and an FDMAS also. Um, when a patient refers to active FD as growing or expanding, has new, has new research show that FD never burns out, but is always active? Yeah, I mean, part of the challenge is there's not really great criteria to say this is an active lesion and this is an inactive lesion. We do have the sense, and we have some data to suggest that FD seems to be more and less active in different times of life. Uh, for example, in children, um, FD lesions typically you know, show up and continue to expand until probably late adolescence, early adulthood. So that's a time when FD is clearly growing and the lesions, the cells in the lesions are dividing a lot and they're clearly an active lesion. Um, we have evidence that over time in adults, um, a lot of the markers we use to kind of look at how active lesions are seem to get better over time. So the markers in the blood that show how actively the how um, quickly the bone is turning over. They gradually come down in adulthood. Um, sometimes on x-rays, we can see that the lesions tend to look kind of more burned out and less, you know, less active on x-rays. And there is evidence that if you do biopsies of lesions in, in older adults, you don't see as many of those mutated cells that cause the FD. The lesions seem to be getting better over time. I don't know that you can say that that would happen at the same rate and in the same way to all the lesions in someone's body. Um, for example, in the skull, it seems that the, uh, there's, we have a sense that the lesions may not burn out quite as quickly or to the same degree. And it's certainly possible that in a person with multiple lesions, one lesion might feel more active than, uh, than another one. Um. I am also having issues with my thyroid. I have a cyst eight centimeters on my thyroid. Could it be another area with FD? In the thyroid? Yes. No. Okay. Uh, it, it is the, probably, again, disclaimer. Disclaimer, of course. Uh, it, it, it's probably the typical uh, MAS associated finding we see in the thyroid. So the thyroid is the, one of the organs that um, what we call extraskeletal, so outside the skeleton, one of the commonly involved extraskeletal tissues. And there's a common type of pathology that occurs in the thyroid. It's, it's benign, it can cause hyperthyroidism. In rare cases, it could lead to malignancy, so it should be watched, it should be followed, there should be regular ultrasounds and review of those. And if there's any concern that it looks uh, like it could be uh, a malignant lesion that should be uh, biopsied or aspirated, a fine needle aspiration. So probably typical uh, lesion, follow it, maybe aspirate it if there's any concerns. Uh, and you know, if there are concerns, surgical excision is always an answer. Yeah, so we even, thyroid disease is very common in MAS, but at this point we don't recommend managing those thyroid nodules any differently in MAS than we do in the general population. And there are really good guidelines 
depending on how big the nodule is, what it looks like on the ultrasound. So that's something that endocrinologists deal with quite commonly. Um, so it, it tends to be one of the more clearer cut uh, problems to deal with. Um, does a person with FD have to worry about passing on FD to their children? Is whatever genetic mutation caused the FD in the first place a permanent mutation? Would it require both parents for this risk to be passed on? No, it's not transmitted from parent to child, um, period. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that, that's a really important point because we have encountered patients from years ago who had this worry and had this concern and were even told that they could do this and, and for that reason didn't have children. So, But it is not transmitted from parent to child. Yeah, and kind of a related point I think can't be stressed enough is there is nothing we know of that causes this mutation. Um, it's something that happens when the baby is developing in utero during the pregnancy, um, but there is nothing that a mother does or doesn't do while she's pregnant. There's nothing a father does or doesn't do, you know, prior to conceiving the baby that can make this mutation happen. It's just a spot in the DNA that's hard to copy, and you know, sometimes these mutations occur, but it's. it's Really, nobody's fault. Uh, a lot of good questions. Yeah, there are a lot of questions mm -hmm. here. Is there an increase in breast cancer and other other cancers in an MAS patient that has high alkaline phosphate level? So the high alkaline phosphatase is very common in FD. It just reflects that the bones are more active than typical. Um, so just a high alkphos in and of itself isn't something that makes us worry about patients with FD. People who don't know about FD might, I could see why you know a clinician might be worried when they see that marker because in the in someone without FD, sometimes that high alkaline phosphatase can be a warning sign for a bone cancer or a liver cancer, but that doesn't appear to be a, a reliable marker for that in a patient with MAS. And then I think Dr. Boyce talked previously about the, the risk for cancer. So there, you know, in the tissues that are affected, there's probably a teeny bit uh, a risk of cancer, mm -hmm. but, but not a significant. Yeah, other than the breast cancer, we don't have any specific screening procedures we, we uh, recommend in MAS. We recommend that people follow the same screening procedures for the general population for things like colonoscopies and prostate. You know, Here's one. I have FD severely in the right side of my, I have severely in the right side of my skull. It's always growing outward. Now it's caving in. I'm worried. Again, hard to know uh, definitively. Typically, it, it, FD grows outwardly, as she said, or he said. Uh, uncommonly, there is some uh, pressure on the brain and pushes the brain a little bit. We've never seen it be the case that it um, uh, affects brain function. Um, that said, and I think Dr. Boyce mentioned this earlier too, you can get fluid-filled cysts within fibrous dysplasia that do have the potential to expand relatively rapidly and do have the potential to put pressure on the brain that can cause symptoms, and those need to be seen and excised uh, after you have an MRI to make the diagnosis. But there are cases where the fibrous dysplasia can grow inward a bit and it can uh, displace or dislodge the brain a bit. It's always been kind of amazing to me how much you can <laughs> push the brain around do things to the brain and still have normal brain function. So almost certainly there's uh, not uh, brain function abnormalities associated with a little bit of growing in and pushing on the brain. But yeah, if you're really concerned and feels like a lesion is changing in its shape or characteristic, it's generally a good idea to talk to your doctor about getting imaging. Um, this lady writes, I only have one cafe au lait spot, which is very small on my elbow the opposite side of my FD. My daughter has them, however, has them all over her body. Coincidence? Yeah, cafe au lait macules are actually really common, and that makes it tricky when we talk about them as a feature of MAS. Um, in general, you know, we see many, many patients with and without FD that have kind of cafe au lait macules that are smallish and have smooth borders and can be really located anywhere. Uh, the type in MAS have a very different appearance. They have these jagged borders, they tend to either reflect along the midline of the body or show some relationship with the midline of the body. Um, so probably, and certainly if it's something that you, you, both a parent and a child have, I think that by definition that's not going to be related to MAS and it's probably a coincidence or maybe some other gene. <laughs>
My son is three and was recently diagnosed with MAS, including FD, and his proximino, proximal, is that how you say it? Mm -hmm. Femur. Yes. Is there a recommendation for utilizing screening imaging for craniofacial involvement in this age? Well, it's a great question. So, um, and we have really specific information on this in the guidelines because it's an important question. So, um, when a young, as we talked about, you know, childhood is a period of time where the FD lesions tend to grow and new FD lesions can continue to appear. Um, we know that by age five, if a patient undergoes a very detailed uh, bone scan that very sen will very sensitively show where the, all of the FD lesions are. Um, by age five, basically anywhere FD is going to cause a problem, you will see it apparent at that point. Um, for, so if you are going to have FD in your skull, it will be present on a bone scan at age five. If you have a bone scan at age five and it doesn't show any FD in the skull, you will not develop FD in the skull most likely. Um, so again, for that person we're saying, yeah, probably at the age of five. Bone scan at age five, and um, we do have some info in the guidelines. If, for example, if there are symptoms of, mm. of skull lesions earlier than that, you don't necessarily have to wait until five if there's a real clinical concern that develops mm -hmm. earlier. But in all patients who have a uh, diagnosis of FD or MAS should undergo a bone scan at age five so that we can know for sure if and where they have FD. What advice would you give to someone who's going to a new doctor? Mayo Clinic of Jacksonville, Florida. I've been having more severe pain in, in the left leg and the back. 1999, I was diagnosed with polycystic fibrous dysplasia. I guess they should bring the toolkit. They should bring the toolkit and they should share the guidelines with their yeah, doctor. That's a lot of why we developed them, so it's a great example. A perfect example. So I'm looking at the time and we have about five more minutes left. Um, are you up for a couple more questions? Oh, yeah, We're good. A couple. Okay. Um, is there a risk from taking reclass multiple times? I was told not to do the infusion more than five times. So, uh, again, disclaimer, but um, reclass is a type of bisphosphonate. Um, uh, it's one of the more potent ones. It's approved and used for osteoporosis. It's used for osteoporosis is one infusion per year. Uh, and for osteoporosis, you probably should not uh, have it more than five times, so for five years, because the risk of osteoporosis of the jaw may increase after that. Um, and so with fibrous dysplasia, we tend to use uh, higher doses, but not higher doses, but doses more often than once a year. And again, as Dr. Boyce pointed out, the, 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 the reason you take the drug is to relieve pain. And once pain is relieved, you don't need another infusion until the pain comes back. And that could be 12 months, 18 months, it could be less. And, and it's a balancing act. Um, you know, we do know that beyond five infusions over five years, the risk of osteonecrosis of the jaw begins to increase a little bit. So, if it's the only thing that relieves pain, uh, it's a choice of not getting it, and lowering your osteonecrosis of the jaw risk, or the other choice would be to get the infusion, relieve the pain, watch your teeth very carefully. It's an individualized choice, it's a negotiation, it's a discussion between the doctor, but five infusions period, no more, abs is not an absolute uh, hard and fast rule. And I would say that in fibrous dysplasia, most patients with pretty bad disease need, need more uh, reclass than that. And, and I think one point to consider in that too is it's, you know, anytime you have chronic pain for any condition, um, it's important to think about it in a really holistic way. Um, there's, it's never as simple as this, give this one medication and the pain gets better. So when we have patients with FD who have received multiple infusions with bisphosphonates, personally, I always feel most comfortable pairing with a pain medicine specialist to make sure that they're also we have the opportunities to be exposed to other therapies that might either help the bisphosphonates work or mm -hmm. maybe help us get away with less bisphosphonates or less frequent infusions. So we've had patients that have had benefit from acupuncture, biofeedback, mm -hmm. mindfulness, um, sometimes other medications like gabapentin, mm -hmm. oral medications, um, physical therapy. You know, I think you really want to think outside the box and view the patient as a whole person and not just a bone that's hurting. And the reason to take them is for pain. 
Yes. I mean, because there was a period of time where if you had fibrous dysplasia, that in and of itself, even without pain, was thought to be an indication for dysphosphonates. And we no longer think that that's the case. Yeah, they probably are not going to decrease your fracture risk from it at the um, behave differently, unfortunately. And so for our final question, what's next on the horizon for FDMAS researchers? Are there any exciting advances taking place? <laughs> that's a great last question. Yeah. <laughs> I think the answer is yeah, there's a lot of really interesting things taking place from efforts to target the molecular defects, so molecules, drugs that would specifically target the mutation FDMS, that's a, an effort that's going on here and other places. Uh, efforts with the bisphosphonate studies, that, that not the denosumab yeah. studies yeah. that Dr. Boyce is conducting. Uh, there was a trial in France that used an inhibitor of interleukin-6. Uh, we don't have the results yet of that, but that may be an option. Uh, I think we're learning more about fibrous dysplasia all the time. I think the research is robust, and I'm, I'm certain that it's going to identify targets uh, that we didn't know exist today. So um, I would say the biggest ones like on the table now are research studies with denosumab, mm -hmm. research studies with the anti-IL-6. Um, anything else? Yeah, I so mean, we, that four patients. Right, so we we currently have an ongoing uh, study of denosumab treatment that we're recruiting for. Um, that's a drug that's commercially available, so if we do find evidence that it might be helpful, um, there is the potential to you know start using that medication soon, as soon as we can figure out if and how it can be used safely. Um, yeah, I think that's... that's the yeah, there's a lot of uh, important research going on as well that, mm -hmm. that I, I'm certain will have uh, lead to beneficial treatments for patients later. Mm -hmm. And patient involvement, of course, is yeah. one of our primary things at Fibrous Dysplasia Foundation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Fibrous Dysplasia Foundation has played a major role in raising money to fund researchers around the world to uh, develop and treatments for fibrous dysplasia better understand the pathophysiology of the disease that then leads to treatments. Well, on behalf of the Fibrous Dysplasia Foundation, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart today. Um, you've given out so much helpful advice to the people who've taken the time to give in mm -hmm. questions. We've not gotten to all the questions, mm -hmm. but we've gotten to a great majority of them. Again, if your question was not answered um, during this session, we will be looking at it and use it for future education. Um, I believe that the slides have been posted to Facebook, but they will be made available on our website as well. So the answer to a lot of the, I bet a lot of those questions are in these guidelines with the detailed read. Or on the FDF informational page. Yes. That's <laughs> right, that's right. So on behalf of the Fibrous Dysplasia Foundation, I thank everybody. Um, especially Dr. Collins and Dr. Boyce for participating and learning about the clinical pathways. Our next live stream will take place November 15th, live from Orlando, Florida. Please watch for the newsletter blast and for more information about that. I also wanna mention that, um, and we've talked about this a little bit, that the Fibrous Dysplasia Foundation is a not-for-profit and it's run entirely on charitable donations. We are launching an ambitious end of the year campaign to build our organizational infrastructure and to ensure that um, you, the patients, have the most up-to-date resources, and for, especially for patients who are newly diagnosed and who are requesting help. So um, we hope that you'll help us join, reach our goal. We're gonna launch our end of year campaign on Giving, Tuesday, Giving Tuesday, where we're hoping to raise $30,000 that day, which is a lot. Um, if you want to get started early, you can text join FDMAS to 44-321 or visit Heal Our Bones. And again, um, thank you, Dr. Collins. Thank you, Dr. Boyce. And thank you for listening in to this um, live stream and um, looking forward to seeing you in the future.